Duahine is the mountain. Urawa is the river. Manawatu is the ancestral land. Aurangi is the marae. Edward Taihakure Duri is the man. The youngest of three sons born to a Māori father and to Pākehā mother, Edward Taihakure Duri was born 100 years after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Raised by his Māori grandparents, he is the first Māori land court judge whose expertise has been to interpret both Western law and Māori law in a way that now recognises the rights of indigenous Māori people. He descends from the Rangitane and Ngāti Kaufata people of the Manawatū. We have a right to cultural survival and I think it is not always appreciated that there is only one place where Māori culture can survive and that's here in New Zealand. In 1975, Māori protesters marched from the top of the North Island to the steps of Parliament, demanding that the government stop taking their lands. When it was initially proposed that there should be some form of recognition of the Treaty of Waitangi, most people thought that that was simply preposterous. You couldn't have that. They said it was too vague. Um, they said it was also obsolete, it was a historical anachronism. One had to reform that court. One had to reform its process. And one had to promote the reform of Māori land law at the same time. One could just see a huge task. Eddie Jury's work was so important in changing that court from being a court just administering individualised Māori interests for the benefit of individual Māori owners and often still alienating them out of the hands of Māori to a court which found ways and means of giving expression to Fano trusts, to Putia trusts, to Ahu Whenua trusts in ways that uh, were not possible um, before Eddie Jury became Chief Judge of the, of the Māori Land Court. He has been a judge longer than almost anyone I can remember. He was made a Māori Land Court judge at the age of 34. He then became the Chief Māori Land Court judge. Then he became the Chair of the Waitangi Tribunal. Then he became a High Court judge. That is a very distinguished legal career. I'm no longer a judge. I can actually say for the first time things that I've never said before because I've never been able to say them. Despite the constraints of his role, this man, small in stature, became the first Māori Land Court judge, the youngest amongst his peers at the time. Through his work, he speaks volumes to the people of Aotearoa and indeed the world. The matriarch of the Dury Fano, Reverend Kahu Dury, watched him grow up. He is the youngest of the family. The boys, they were all very affectionate children um, and very respectful, especially to their Queen Kuro. And that was my parents. My parents were always still Anglicans. And the boys, they helped a lot with the chores, like, like in the milking shed and around the garden. My tuition began, I think, in three three places. They were my own marae, Aurangi marae, in the Manawatu. Uh, the Borthwick's freezing works, and I'll come back to that, as to why I mention it. And then Tauti College. And the marae, I think, was particularly important because what marae's do is that it tells you who you are as a person, 
who your family is, where you have been, where your family has been in the past, where they are today, and gives you some indication of where you might properly be heading in the future. It locates you in time and space. We cared a lot about them all, and, and they knew, I think, that it sort of felt encouraging for them, and they felt the warmth and the love, and that help, you know, as it does, it helps children. The marae was headed by my grandfather, who took a very active role um, in the administration of Māori Affairs, as a member of the Board of Māori Affairs, for example, and my grandmother, who took an active role in the Māori Women's Welfare League when, when that was formed. Eddie and his brothers, before tea, they would go to the meeting house and do their homework. And my sisters told me that they would often sneak up to the windows and have a look, because they, they didn't believe that these, these kids would be doing their homework properly. They'd probably be playing around in there. And, you know, they, they said, you know, those boys were all doing their homework. They were so, you know, so surprised. Oh, so I was I. Then went to Borthwick's, which is the freezing works just down the road from um, um, our marae. Um, starting there uh, at age 13 and um, going there through to age 18 during the summer vacation period. Now, of course, 13 is underage. I think the factory act said you had to be 16 at that time. But that didn't seem to matter very much in those days. I worked on the chain and what was important there for me was it was still the family experience because just about everyone on the four chains that existed there were family. My father worked there, my two brothers worked there, and it was almost an accepted rite of passage for young people. It's a little bit tough, I think, with hindsight and getting you in there at the tender age of 13. And I remember saying to my mother, I don't think Eddie should be in and there he's too young, isn't he? She said, oh, uh, well, he likes it there. He's a good worker. And uh, they had to go to, to, to the freezing works to uh, help financially with their own education. Eddie went to primary school with the others in fielding, and he followed in most of the footsteps of the boys that had gone before in the family. I went to Te Aute College in Hawke's Bay. Why was Te Aute College important? I think it was because when I got there, it, it dawned on me for the first time that, that, that while we had a conception of being a tightly knit family group under a, or hapu group under a, with a particular genealogy, that we linked to Māoris from one end of the island to the other. Māoris knew how to manipulate those um, whakapapa to establish connections, which served to remind me that we really are